Today's lecture is about the sociological concept of boundaries, both symbolic and social. When we think of the word boundaries, physical boundaries like fences, walls and borders often come to mind. Some of us may also think of personal boundaries, such as the kind of things we consider to be within the bounds of respectful conversation. However, when sociologists use the term boundaries, they often refer to two other primary forms of boundaries, symbolic and social. Symbolic boundaries are conceptual distinctions made by social actors to categorize objects, people, practices, and even time and space. Basically, they are the distinctions people with agency or social actors mentally make in order to distinguish certain things from other things. For instance, a list of qualifications for a job constitutes the symbolic boundaries for that occupation to distinguish between those who are qualified to apply for the job and those who aren't. However, as the definition shows, symbolic boundaries can also refer to a host of other things as well, besides just job application criteria. Here are a couple of examples. How do we know the difference between a chair and a desk? On the one hand, we know them by their practical purpose. Chairs are meant for sitting and desks for working or writing on. But there are also certain characteristics that we attribute to one but not the other. For instance, we expect that if we place the two side by side, the chair is probably going to be at a lower elevation than the desk to allow someone to sit on the chair while still being able to use the desk for writing. A desk is probably also going to be wider than a chair to allow us more space to work on. All these criteria by which we decide what is a desk and what is a chair constitute symbolic boundaries. We also use symbolic boundaries to distinguish social types of people, for instance, between students and instructors. In a classroom, we generally expect students to be seated, at least during the course of most of the lecture, and to be facing the front of the class. In contrast, we expect instructors to be at the front of the classroom facing the students. We expect students to be taking notes and generally to only be talking during discussion sessions or when asking or answering a question posed by the instructor. In contrast, we expect that most instructors will be the ones talking most of the time. We expect students to be there to learn while we expect instructors to be there to teach. Traditionally, we expect instructors to typically be older than the average student, although that is not always the case. We often expect instructors to be more formally dressed than students, although that too is not always the case. Once again, all these expectations we have for what the average student and instructor look like and how they behave differently constitute the symbolic boundaries by which we distinguish different social roles in society. What about social practices? One common practice is attending a live football game which, depending on what culture you're from, could either refer to the first or second picture. On the one hand, we have symbolic boundaries distinguishing going to a game like this from, say, going to work. For one, going to a game is a leisurely activity, whereas going to work is something you do for a living. That usually means most of us tend to enjoy the first more than the second. The venues for each differ, as does the expected dress code. Even the people you meet and interact with will differ to some degree. We also have symbolic boundaries differentiating these two types of football, again depending on the culture you're from. In one, the use of one's arms are clearly off limits unless you are the goalkeeper. In the other, you are expected to be carrying the ball while you run. In one, body contact with other players is off-limits, in the other, it's expected. In one, most of the protection you wear is over your shins, while in the other, much of your upper body is encased in armour, or something. I clearly don't watch much American football. Time. We also use symbolic boundaries to distinguish between measurements of time. We know that 60 minutes make up an hour, 24 hours make a day, 28 to 31 days make a month, depending on which month, and 12 months make a year. These are conceptual ways of distinguishing packets of time that are almost universally agreed upon around the world. However, we also know that there are different time zones in different parts of the world where the time of day varies from other time zones. We know that most of the world agrees that our current metric of time progression, commonly called CE, or the Common Era, begins 2000 plus years ago. We also know that at certain points in the year, some countries wind back or forward their clocks as part of daylight savings. How do we define different spaces? Countries use largely but not always agreed upon boundaries by which to distinguish their land from those of another country. 
Now, of course, these symbolic boundaries also imply physical boundaries, for instance, border fences and walls, as well as immigration checkpoints. But one can only place these physical barriers down if the symbolic barriers have been established. Personal space boundaries are a little different because they tend to be less formalized. But depending on the culture we live in, most of us eventually learn how much proximity tends to get interpreted as too much proximity. We also know that we construct different sizes of personal space depending on who we are with. Next we have social boundaries, which are objectified forms of social differences manifested in unequal access to and unequal distribution of resources, material and non-material, and social opportunities. By objective, we mean that these boundaries are not just restricted to cognitive concepts in people's collective minds, but rather have real practical manifestations in the world around us. The example of national boundaries is a good example. Again, although they are symbolic and cognitive in the sense that countries usually agree upon where these boundaries lie between them, they are also social in that they have practical social ramifications because we know that we cannot cross these boundaries with impunity. Fences and walls are there to physically keep us out, but so are warning signs that remind us that there will be consequences should we cross the line. But not all social boundaries are so easily visible or formally ratified. As the definition indicates, social boundaries can be of various sorts and manifest themselves in the form of, quote, unequal access to an unequal distribution of resources and social opportunities, meaning that these boundaries limit or filter who is able to have and to get certain resources and opportunities, and who is not. Resources, as the definition mentions, can be in both material and non-material forms. Material resources can refer to things like wealth or property. For instance, in some countries, it is legal for parents to pass down their wealth and property to their offspring, often with some kind of estate tax, but in other countries, that may be legal. Being employed in a given job typically gives one access to material compensation in the form of an income. In certain places and times, it was or is illegal for people of a certain race or ethnicity to own property, including those sold as slaves or working in other forms of indentured servitude. All these examples show how restrictions can be placed or not on who has and can have access to material resources. Information is an example of a non-material resource. The President of the United States, for instance, is typically given daily briefings in which he is provided with vital information by which to govern the country. However, this information isn't something available to anyone, not just because it is collected specifically for the leader of the country, but also because some of it is classified and could be harmful to the interests of the US if leaked into the wrong hands. Your educational diploma is also a kind of non-material resource in that having it opens doorways to the kinds of jobs you can apply for. Besides resources, social boundaries also determine access to social opportunities and how they are distributed among people. If your educational degree acts as a non-material resource by which you can get a job, then the ability to get the job itself is an example of a social opportunity. While having a job usually entitles you to some form of monetary compensation, material resources in other words, one must first have the social opportunity to even apply for the job in the first place. Part of this is afforded by your educational degree, but that isn't the only thing that matters. In some places that use the caste system, belonging to a specific caste might make you eligible for some jobs but not others. Non-citizens living in a country usually have far more restrictions about the jobs they can apply for than citizens. Fraternities and sororities often have large social networks of alumni through which various job opportunities can be shared and mentoring given. And as that last example suggested, social opportunities aren't just restricted to jobs. As another example, certain venues or events with famous performers or other celebrities may sometimes offer people who have VIP passes opportunities to meet their idols face to face. Some religious communities or some strict parents may impose restrictions on who their members, in the case of communities, or children, in the case of parents, may date and marry. The ability or lack thereof to engage in these social practices of dating and marrying also reflects social opportunities that can be granted or prohibited through social boundaries. In order for social boundaries to exist, symbolic boundaries must both exist and be widely shared. 
In other words, in order for there to be unequal access to and distribution of resources and opportunities, there has to be some way to distinguish between those who quote-unquote should have access and those who should not. For instance, it is impossible for border patrols and immigration centers to grant and deny access to a country if the geopolitical boundaries of that country in symbolic form have not been defined and ratified. At a more social level, it is impossible for people and institutions to be racist to a specific race of people if there is no way by which to distinguish people, accurately or not, by race. Sexism against women would not have been possible if people, typically men, were unable to decide, accurately or not, who were women. Religions that prohibit or at least advise against inter-religious marriage would be unable to enforce these prohibitions or make their recommendations if there were not criteria by which to determine who was a member of the religion and who wasn't. Now, of course, not all social boundaries are of the sort that are as self-evidently problematic. For instance, most of us would probably agree that only employees of a country should be paid a salary by that company. Most of us would probably agree that if we pay for membership, for instance, to a streaming service like Netflix or Hulu, we should be granted access to movies and television that those who do not pay for that membership should not have, at least not to the same degree. In this lecture, we have talked about symbolic boundaries as conceptual distinctions and social boundaries as objective differences in the form of unequal access to and unequal distribution of resources and opportunities. Symbolic boundaries, as we learned, apply to nearly everything, including objects, people, practices, and even space and time. Social boundaries, in the meantime, limit who is and is not granted access to resources, both of the material and non-material sort, as well as social opportunities.